November 30th through December 4th, join James and Teresa Merritt for the 6th Annual Mountaintop Conference, featuring Overwhelmed But Not Broken. Three power-packed teaching sessions from Dr. James Merritt. We'll have special evenings with Luke Zamperini, Will Graham, and musical entertainment at the Smoky Mountain Opry. There's even an optional day at Dollywood. Meet us on the mountain November 30th through December 4th in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Call 800-523-3919 or visit mountaintopconference.com for all the details. Today on Touching Lives. So I don't care what else is said about you or your spouse or your marriage. If your kids and your grandkids and your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers can look at you and your spouse and say, behold, how they love one another. Two can stay one. With hope and encouragement for life, this is Touching Lives with James Merritt. The following story that I'm going to tell you is true, and if you're single and you're contemplating getting married either now or later on, don't try this at home. On my very first date with Teresa, I told her, we were in the course of our conversation, I said, look, I want you to know I only tell a girl that I love her if I want to marry her. And she kind of looked at me like, why are you telling me this on our first date? I mean, why, why do I even care, you know, about that? And I warned her, I said, I just want to warn you, if I tell you that I love you, I'm asking you to marry me. And she didn't, you know, respond. Well, the next night on our second date, I told her I loved her. <laughs> and if I'd been a comedian, I would have thought I'd really have, you know, was, had a job because I don't think she's quit laughing yet. And that's 37 years ago. Now, I was serious. And you know the story. Six months later, we were married. And uh, since the wedding, being just transparent, above board, open book. Uh, we have fought. Uh, she has pouted. <laughs> um, we've had about three spitting contests. We haven't always seen eye to eye. Um, and I don't mind telling you that sometimes our marriage has been more of a battle than it has been a blessing. But we've worked through problems, and we have talked through disagreements, and we've persevered through conflict, and as I love to tell people, I've never, as of this day, I've never loved her more than I do right now. And I have learned after three and a half decades of marriage, it's possible to stay in love after you fall in love. Not easy, but it is possible to stay in love after you fall in love. Now, there's a big difference between falling in love and staying in love. One takes a pulse. The other takes commitment. Well, today we're going to talk about love because I want to answer this question, which is a big question that a lot of you probably are asking. Okay, I understand how two can become one, but can two really stay one? I mean, is that really possible? I mean, is it really possible to stay in love after you fall in love? They asked some kids the question, how can a married couple stay in love? And uh, there were a lot of answers. I picked out just three of the ones I really liked. This, these are from just elementary school kids when they were asked, so how can a married couple stay in love? Here's what Tom said. He's seven years old. Spend most of your time loving instead of going to work. <laughs> now, when we first got married, that's what I wanted to do. I'll just be honest. I mean, I, I thought, you know, that's pretty good, but you can't, you know, real life, you can't do that. So then Roger, eight years old, said this. Don't forget your wife's name. That will mess up the love for sure. Well, I agree with that. I think we'd all say, yeah, that's pretty good advice. But I saved this, this guy. I want to meet Randy. I don't know who Randy is. He's eight years old. I thought this was the best one. Be a good kisser. It might make your wife forget that you never take out the trash. <laughs> now, the question is not how do you fall in love? The question is, why is it that so many people fall in love, but they can't stay in love? Why is that? And how do you do it? Well, tucked away in one of the four Gospels is a little two-paragraph statement that Jesus made that not only gives us the foundation for any relationship that endures, but it speaks of the kind of love that is so strong that if a husband and wife have this kind of love, nothing or nobody can break it. 
So if you brought a copy of God's Word or want to get on your iPad or iPhone, however you do it, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. There are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You say, I don't even know where the first Gospel is. Just kind of go to the middle of the Bible, turn east. You'll hit Matthew, then Mark, then Luke, and John. And we're in John chapter 13. Now before I get into what Jesus said, let me tell you what's really interesting about what we're going to read. When Jesus talked about love in this passage, He wasn't even talking about marriage. He wasn't even talking to spouses. He was just talking to disciples. And yet what you're going to find out this morning is, is that what Jesus said about, about love among believers also works for marriage. What Jesus said to believers specifically applies to marriage specifically. So here's what you're going to find that Jesus said. This is my little key takeaway for the morning. You stay in love with a love from above. That's how you do it. Let's say that together. You stay in love with a love from above. That's how you do it. You stay in love with a love from above. Now we're going to read these two verses of Scripture. John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Two little short paragraphs, not, you know, not real deep, not really profound, at least on the surface of it. And yet, tucked away in those two verses of Scripture are three things Jesus said that love is and that love does. And He says something about love that no one's ever said before, that no one has ever said since. And He gives us the keys on how two people can meet, how two people can fall in love, and how two people can stay in love after they fall in love. Because it, love is what it, it, it's what love is and what love does that makes all the difference in two being able to stay one. So how do two stay one? Real simple. It's such a simple message today, but it's so true. First of all, two can stay one by obeying the command of Jesus. Two can stay one by simply obeying the command of Jesus. Here's what he said in verse 34. He said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Now, first of all, notice this is not a new suggestion. It's a new command. And he says, I want you to love one another. Now you say, well, pastor, what makes you think that applies to marriage? Well, in order to love one another, it takes two, right? You can't love one another by yourself. So therefore, I know this applies to a husband and a wife because they have one another. They have each other. And Jesus said, this is a commandment that I'm giving you. I'm not giving you a choice. It's not an option. I'm not asking you this. I'm not requesting this. I am ordering you. I am commanding you that you love one another. Now, I've told you before that if Jesus says, once, says something once, that's enough. Do not, do not, you know, if he says it, that's it. You need to do whatever he tells you. But whenever Jesus repeats something, you better really get your radar up. You better really raise your antenna. Because if Jesus says something more than once, He said, all right, this is a really big deal to me. And He repeats this commandment not once, not twice, but three times. Because in John 15, 12, He says this, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. He said in John 15, 17, these things I command you so that you will love one another. So three times Jesus says to the disciples, I'm commanding you, I'm ordering you, I am demanding of you that you love one another. Now what does that tell you about love? It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. You know, you, you cannot command a feeling, right? I mean, if you went to a doctor you went to a doctor, and you waited two hours in the office to see this doctor, and you walk in, the doctor says, well, what's wrong with you? And you go, I just don't feel well. Now, how would you feel if that doctor said, well, feel good, it'll be $30? Now, you wouldn't go back, because you can't command a feeling. Now, love may express itself emotionally. I mean, you know, you fall in love, and you get the warm feeling in your tummy, and it makes you tear up, and it makes your heart rate beat faster, and all that kind of stuff. But none of those are signs of real love. Love has absolutely nothing to do with feelings. Feelings are irrelevant. I, I, let me give you an example. Real easy to understand this. Liking somebody is a feeling. Right? I mean, you know, that, that's why I learned a long time ago. There's a big difference between liking people and loving people. Do, do you notice this? Jesus never commands us, like your enemies. He never says that. He says, love your enemies. He doesn't say, like your enemies. Now, why does Jesus not command us to like somebody? Because you can't command that. 
You can't command somebody to like somebody else. Because liking someone is purely an emotional response. It's a feeling. Liking and loving are two different things. Loving is an action. See, I, I've, I've learned this. I don't have to like someone to love them. And I, I'm going to be honest with you right now. I love people that I don't necessarily like. Okay? You know, Will Rogers said, I never met a man I didn't like. Well, Will, let me introduce you to some people I've met. Okay? I, I mean, I'm just telling you. The truth of the matter is, I hate to burst some of your bubbles in here this morning. Not everybody that loves you likes you. Unless you're me. Okay? But it, it, not everybody that loves you is going to like you. There's a world just between love and emotion. It, it, listen. If love was a feeling, if love was an emotion, Jesus would have never died on the cross. Because he made it real plain. I don't feel like doing this today. Father, if it be possible, is there a plan B? If it be possible, please let this pass from me. He didn't feel like going to the cross. He made it very plain. I really don't want to do this. Love is not a matter of feeling. It has nothing to do with feeling. It is a matter of obedience. Love is not just a noun. It is a verb. When you fall in love, you're talking about a feeling that you have. When you stay in love, you talk about a commitment that you make. Love is not an emotion that you feel. It is an action that you do. So how can two stay one? Well, first of all, you stay one by saying, you know what? I'm going to obey the command of Jesus. Then you can also stay one by following the model of Jesus. Because notice what he says in verse 34 again. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Then he goes on to add this. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Now, here's something interesting. Jesus comes along and he says to these disciples, I'm giving you a new commandment that you love one another. Now, at first the disciples thought, wait a minute, that's not new. I mean, the, the, the Old Testament teaches that we're to love our neighbor. That's, that's in the book of Leviticus. So why is this new? Here's what makes this a new commandment. Jesus didn't just say, love one another. That's not new. Here's what's new. He said, love one another just as I have loved you. And the disciples go, whoa. You mean, I got to love Peter and John the way you love me? Yeah, and and Judas, you got to love Simon the way I love you. That's the way it works. Now, Nobody in history has ever loved the way Jesus loves. Nobody. Contrary to folklore, Casanova is not the world's greatest lover. Jesus is the world's greatest lover. Nobody has ever loved like Jesus loved. And speaking specifically of marriage, Jesus says, all right, husband, I want you to love your wife the way I love you. And all right, wife, I want you to love your husband the way that I love you. Now, I know you're sitting here, you're going, well, that, that's just impossible. No, it really isn't. It really isn't. Because that verse could also be translated this way. You're to give the love to others that I have given you. Now, let me, let me tell you what Jesus was saying and why this is so big. If you are a true follower of Jesus today, and I don't know whether you are or not, but if you're sitting there and you claim to be a follower of Jesus, I know there are two things in you right now. I know there are. Otherwise, you're not a follower of Jesus. Number one, I know Jesus is in you. If you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus is in you. And if Jesus is in you, the love of Jesus is in you. And what Jesus is simply saying is this, look, I want you to take the love that I have put in you, and I want you to transfer it to your spouse. That's all I want you to do. You take the love that I have placed in your heart. It's not your love. It's my love in you. I want to take your love and I want you to transfer it to your spouse. It's it's also a comparative love. We're to love our spouse the same way that Jesus loves us. Well, how does Jesus love us? Well, the number one way he loves us, he loves us sacrificially, right? John 3, 16, we all know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Paul said in Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, when Jesus died for us, when Jesus sacrificed himself for us, he put us first. If Jesus had put himself first, we'd all be up the creek. He wouldn't have died on the cross that day, but he put us first. So listen carefully. 
You know what real love is, husbands and wives? I mean, real love. Not what Hollywood says, not what you think, not what you've been taught. You know what real love is? Real love is putting the other person first. And I'm going to tell you something. You can think this is pie in the sky stuff if you want to. I'm telling you, it's true. You husbands out there, you say you love your wife. I got news for you. If you don't love your wife enough to give your life for her, you don't love your wife. That's how much Jesus loved us. He loved us enough to give his life for us. If you don't love your wife enough to give your life for her, you really don't love your wife. So let me just put this little seed of thought out there. If you can answer this question for me, come see me when the service is over because I, I really can't get my hand around this one. How can a husband divorce a woman that he loves so much he would die for her? How can, how, how can a man do that? So, you know, so just, you know I don't want to hear this. Well, I love her, but I can't live with her. How can you divorce a person that you love so much you would die for? I mean, think about how Jesus loved his disciples. He didn't love his disciples for what he could get out of them. He loved them for what he could give to them. And when you read the New Testament, you'll find out that for three solid years, you know what Jesus did for three years? He put the disciples first every time. Whether it was washing their feet, saving them from a storm, or patiently teaching them time after time after time when they still didn't get it. I mean, he put them first. I don't care who you're married to. And I don't care how much you love them. I know something about you and I know something about your marriage. There are things about your spouse you don't like. There are things about your spouse that drives you up the wall. Teresa says to me, why is it you can remember the score of the Georgia-Florida game five years ago and you can't even remember to get the milk from the grocery store? What's going on with that? <laughs> drives her nuts. 11 o'clock, I'm trying to go to sleep, and she starts eating peanuts in bed. Drives me nuts. <laughs> nuts. So I, I want you to listen. I want you to listen to something that C.S. Lewis said. Th this, this just blew me away when I read this. Listen to this. C.S. Lewis said, there's someone I love, even though I don't approve of what he does. There's someone I accept, though some of his thoughts and actions revolt me. There's someone I forgive, though he hurts the people I love the most, and that person is me. There are plenty of things I do that I don't like, but if I can love myself without approving of all I can, uh, of all I do, I can also love others without approving of all that they do. And as that truth has been absorbed into my life, it has changed the way I view other people. C.S. Lewis was right. If I can live with me, why can't I live with her? If I can overlook my thoughts, why can't I overlook hers? If I can give me the benefit of the doubt, why can't I give her the benefit of the doubt? If I can give me grace, why can't I give her grace? See, let's, get, let's just get straight to the point. Some of you are sitting there right now maybe, and here's what you're thinking. You're saying, <laughs> you're not married to her. You're, you're not married to him. No, and I won't ever be married to him. Let's get that straight. But I'm just saying... <laughs> You're not married to her. And, you know, she's not married to him. And you're sitting there and you're going, I just can't love him anymore. I, I've had it up to here. I can't love him anymore. I can't love her anymore. I hate to tell you this when we real blunt. That's just not true. Because love is not a matter of can or can't. Love is a matter of will or won't. It has nothing to do with can or can't. I don't care whether you can do it or not. You don't command cans and can'ts, you command wills and wants. And if you love your spouse the way Jesus loves you, so much he was willing to die for you, so much he was willing to die to himself, so much he was willing to overlook your faults and still love you, then if his love is in you, you can love your spouse the same way. And so by the way, you can stay in love by obeying the command of Jesus. You can stay in love by following the model of Jesus. You can stay in love with a love from above. And here's the great thing. This is my favorite part of this passage. Jesus said, when you choose as a married couple, we're going to make it. We're going to work through our problems. We're going to keep this marriage together. We're going to love one another the way that we ought to. Here is the result. 
you will be giving a witness for Jesus. Now listen to what he says. You and your spouse claim to be followers of Jesus. And here's what Jesus would say to you. If Jesus were doing marital counseling today and you came in to see Jesus and you said, you know, we're thinking about hanging it up. We're thinking about throwing in the towel. We're thinking about calling it quits. Here's what Jesus would say to you. He would say, would you understand what's at stake by, by, by you know, in this? Well, yeah, we know we ought to keep, keep, keep the marriage good for the sake of the kids. Jesus would say, oh, there's more at stake than that. Well, yeah, we, we know we ought to really kind of keep this marriage together, you know, because we want to stay true to our vows. And Jesus said, oh, but there's more to it than that. Yeah, we know we ought to keep our marriage together, you know, because it just gets so financially messy if you get a divorce. Jesus said, oh, there's more at stake than that. Jesus would say, I'll tell you the number one reason why you ought to hold that marriage together. It's not your kids. It's not your vows. It's not your money. It's your witness before this world. Because Jesus goes on to say in verse 35, by this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Now listen to what Jesus said. He said, when two people become one and they make up their mind they're going to stay one, the world will say, you're the real deal. Your neighbors will look at you and they'll say, man, Jesus evidently really makes a difference. I, th this thing called Christianity is a game changer. And Jesus said, what will make your next door neighbors and buddies sit up and, t and, and take notice is not by just talking about how much you love God or saying how much you love Jesus because that's just talk. He said, the way an unbelieving world will sit up and pay attention and say, well, maybe it is worth following Jesus. And maybe Jesus is worth following is when you love one another and you stay in love with one another. Jesus said, that's the game changer. This world's not going to know. This world is not going to know that we're disciples because of bumper stickers on the back of our car. I saw one the other day. I loved it. It said, honk. It said, tithe, if you love Jesus, anybody can honk. <laughs> this world's not going to know that you love Jesus because of a bumper sticker on the back of your car or a lapel pin on your coat or a cross around your neck. Jesus said, I'll tell you how the world's going to know that this thing is real when they see you loving each other. And one of the greatest witnesses a married couple can give to their neighbors is to stay married, work through the problem, hang in the battle, refuse to surrender, keep loving one another. Otherwise, here's what Jesus said will happen. You're going to give an unbelieving world a reason to say, you know, your marriage is no different than mine. And you're telling me I ought to give my life to Jesus. Well, why, did I, why should I do that? Let me just kind of wrap up. Our, our mission statement, as you know, is to love God, serve others, and share your story. And there's a reason for that. It has to do with marriage. See, when you love God, then you'll love your spouse the way God loves you. When you love your spouse the way God loves you, you'll serve your spouse and put your spouse first. And when you do that, what a story you'll have to share with other couples who need to know how they can make it. So when you think about, and I do this all the time, whenever time I read the book of Acts, I always ask myself, how in the world did a bunch, just, just a few disciples who were very poor, for the most part illiterate, had no political influence whatsoever, how did a few disciples turn this world upside down for Jesus Christ? How did they do that? Every time I read the book of Acts, I think about it. And then I think about a man named Aristides. You never heard of Aristides. Let me tell you about him. Aristides was a, a servant of the Emperor Hadrian of the Roman Empire. And they kept hearing about this thing called Christianity, and, and, and the church was exploding. And, and, and Hadrian, the emperor, was getting nervous because he thought this was a threat to the empire. So he's, he, he tells Aristides, one of his servants, he sends him out as a spy. He says, I want you to go out, and I want you to go to these things called churches, and I want you to go to these people called Christians, and I want you to find out everything you can about them and then report back to me so I can decide what we need to do about them. So he was gone for several months, and he went to churches, and he went to, to meet Christians, and, you know, just clandestinely didn't tell them what he was there for or who he was. They just thought he was another guy, you know, looking for God. And after he gathered, you know, gathered all his information, he comes back and he gives a report to the emperor. And I don't have time to give you the long report that he gave. I just want to share with you one statement that he made at the end of his report that's become famous and, and very well known for people that know this story. His bottom line explanation for why this movement exploded 
He said, was it in, and this was a statement that he made. Behold how they love one another. So I don't care what else is said about you or your spouse or your marriage. If your kids and your grandkids and your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers can look at you and your spouse and say, Behold how they love one another. Two can stay one. Have you fallen out of love with your spouse? Are you seriously considering divorce? Before you take that step, hear this one thing. God desperately wants to heal your marriage. Call Touching Lives today at 800-413-1131. Let's pray together and ask Jesus to show you how to love your spouse the way he loves you. Through him, there is always hope. November 30th through December 4th, join James and Teresa Merritt for the sixth annual Mountaintop Conference, featuring overwhelmed but not broken. Three power-packed teaching sessions from Dr. James Merritt. We'll have special evenings with Luke Zamperini, Will Graham, and musical entertainment at the Smoky Mountain Opry. There's even an optional day at Dollywood. Meet us on the mountain November 30th through December 4th in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Call 800-523-3919 or visit mountaintopconference.com for all the details. Jesus Christ is the most influential person to ever walk the earth. How well do you know him? In the new book, 52 Weeks with Jesus, Dr. James Merritt leads you on a transformative journey sharing what he has learned over a lifetime. This book will help you fall in love with the one who changed everything. 52 Weeks with Jesus is available now through Touching Lives. Order your copy by calling 800-413-1131 or go to touchinglives.org. Whether you're single or married, you can be a testimony of God's love to everyone you come in contact with. The Bible says that they will know we are different because of love. But when you partner with the Ministry of Touching Lives through your faithful prayers and financial support, you are spreading that love around the globe to people you will never even meet.